And so it was that an aging and very wealthy man told his wife that he wanted to take all his money with him to the grave, that his wealth was not to be given to family or charity or church. Please honor me with this final request. And so he died. Against the counsel of friends, family, and even her minister, the wife dutifully fulfilled her husband's wish to be buried with his money. At the gravesite, as the casket was lowered into the ground, there was a hushed silence. Finally, the minister asked the wife, How could you bury him with all that money? It was easy, she said. I wrote him a check. Talk about shrewd stewardship. Those are some sharp powers of judgment. Now Jesus tells his disciples another story about being shrewd. And it is a strange, kind of convoluted sort of story when you hear it for the first time. But he tells this story about a dishonest manager or Sometimes people call him a shrewd steward. In the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, a story about a man who hijacks the hedge funds and mismanages the money market so badly that he can't account for his mistakes. Finally, someone squeals on this squanderer, notifying the rich owner that he, didn't, that he just might go bankrupt if he didn't fire this guy. So the owner summoned the manager and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. In short order, the owner orders an audit of his manager's accounts. He passes off the pink slip and tells him to go ahead and clean out his desk and hand over the keys to his office. And as any of us would do if we lost our jobs, the manager asks, what am I going to do now? I'm being fired and I've got to find a way to pay my bills and put food on my table. I've got a bad back so I can't do manual labor and I'm too ashamed to stand in line at the soup kitchen. Desperate times call for desperate measures so this steward acts shrewdly. He makes a decision that has significant short-term effects so he can secure long-term benefits. Because if he reduces the debts of his borrowers, then once he's fired, he figures out that those same borrowers will be indebted to him for reducing their debts. Makes sense. So even if he doesn't have a job, he'll at least be in the good graces of enough people who just might take care of him after this one last business deal. They will give him a place to stay for as long as he needs until he can get back on his feet. And so the steward, steward meaning someone who is a trustee and a manager of someone else's property and resources, he figures out a pretty slick way to save his neck by cutting deals with his boss's clients. He had already proven himself crafty at cooking the books, so he takes quick action on this too. Still acting on behalf of his boss, he sets up one-on-one -on -one client meetings with every person who is in debt to their company. At the first client meeting, he asks, how much do you owe my master? A hundred jugs of oil? I'll tell you what, here's your bill, make it 50. He gives his client 50% off his loan. At the second client meeting, he asks, how much money do you owe? A hundred containers of wheat? I'll tell you what. Here's your bill, make it 80. 20% off the sizable loan. And what happens next? Well, in a surprising twist, the rich owner commends the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. I mean, he cheated his boss out of more money by cutting the debts of the debtors, but curiously, the owner praises him doing it. Now, we might expect that the owner would bring charges against his manager for fraud, at the very least, embezzlement. But what the manager does is turn debtors into friends. And in a roundabout way, he finally gets his priorities straight. This shrewd and shady businessman finally understands that money is only a means to an end. 
And far from commending dishonest business deals, Jesus rather commends the insight into the connection between resources and relationships. The connection between resources and relationships. And hear the words of Jesus again about this. For the children of this age, whose values are rooted in materialism, are shrewder in dealing with other people's money than are the children of light, whose values are rooted in the spiritual age to come. So Jesus says, be wise as serpents, yet harmless as doves. Though you cannot serve both God and mammon, or money, you can serve God and use mammon, what today's text calls dishonest wealth, for good and holy purposes. Make friends for yourselves with all the resources you have. Make friends for yourselves with all the resources you have. That right there, my friends, is what this season of stewardship is all about. It is about gathering and using all of the resources that we have and doing so shrewdly and smartly. And why do it? The text says, in order to make friends. And who are these friends that we are supposed to make for ourselves? Well, the Gospel of Luke has already given us an answer. Because Luke has Jesus making that pretty plain. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and then you will be blessed. Those are friends as defined by the Gospel of Luke. Poor, crippled, lame, blind. Now, I know that many of us may not immediately identify with the lame, poor, crippled, blind labels, but we are called to make friends with all the resources that we have, and Calvary, look what happens when we pull together all of our resources. We get this. We get us. We get this community as a haven of healing, as a haven of hope, as a house of prayer for all people. We are open to all, closed to none, and we actually mean it. We are a community of friends here. We are all lame and poor and crippled and blind in our own ways too. Don't let the outside stuff fool you. As I've said before, we come to accept that we are the ones who are lame when we can only measure our self-worth according to our net worth. We come to accept that we are the ones who are poor when our lives are consumed by earning profits rather than being profits. We come to accept that we are the crippled ones, not not based on our physical mobility, but based on our spiritual inability to let compassion dominate our friends and our finances, our professions and our possessions, our dinner parties and our political parties. The thing is that we're all walking with invisible crutches and canes, Some of us may not have perfect eyesight, but we can't see Dr. King's vision that all persons are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can never be who you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This was part of the shrewd steward's comeuppance. Being forced to ask that question, all of us ask eventually in one way or another, and some of you asked the question this week, what am I going to do now? This shrewd steward finally figured out that generosity in the end is the best investment. He gets himself out of a hole by building social capital connecting resources with relationships, and it had the effect of making friends as the story goes. It's as if the rich man even turns to the manager he fired to discover the secret of true riches, and that is the generosity of connecting relationships 
and resources. Before he was fired, there was an element of not telling it like it was. He learned first by not getting it right, but he finally went from being a squanderer to being an investor, being honest to God and matching resources with needs. That's why we're doing the important work of building a budget right now for next year, creating a financial plan to make sure that we can fully fund in an honest to God way all that God is calling us to do. And that as we do, we as a church are asking what the shrewd steward asked too. What, what will we do now? What will we do now? I think that's what our Vision 2020 process helped us to discover. What will we do now? Who is God calling us to be now and moving forward? What has it taken to make it 135 years as a community? And what will it take in terms of our investment to make it another, another 135? Some of it comes by gut-checking ourselves from time to time. Theologian Tom Long gets creative with this when he says that the church has something to learn from the shrewd steward. He says, There's, here's how we tell it like it is. That is why Jesus, the Lord of the church, like the master in this parable, confronts the church with a demanding but finally redemptive charge. What is this that I hear about you? Did you hear the rich owner in the text asking the manager, the dishonest manager, the shrewd steward, what is this that I hear about you? Jesus says, you have squandered the treasure of the gospel in a sense. You can no longer carry on business as usual. You can no longer preach greed and call it the gospel. You can no longer run a private club and call it the church. I'm removing you from your position. In short, the grace of God precipitates a crisis in what Tom Long calls an unfaithful church, and we can no longer make our way in the world as we once blithely did. A church planter once told me the difference between the 1950s and today in terms of even, even planting or starting a church is that in the 1950s, you could open the front door, put out a sign, and get out of the way. Not so much anymore. So the question of what will we do? What will we do now that the structures of church and the structures of our authority are shaken? Jesus answers it. Make friends for yourselves with all the resources you have. Make friends for yourselves with all the resources you have. That's how this shrewd steward helps us see what we are called to live in. And that is that we are called to live in a different economy. An economy of God's grace. An economy of grace meant to be grown and meant to be shared. So that when the question is put to us, what is this I hear about you? The answer might sound something like, we hear you've been living in a world where everything you had was turned into releasing people from debt. All your energies have gone on liberating people from disease. And all your passion has gone into setting people free from despair. We can see you don't have much money, but you don't seem to need it because you're surrounded by friends and we'd like to be like you. That is why the witness of Christ through each of us and through our church is needed now more than ever. To live in the economy of God's grace that beckons us forward to be shrewd stewards of the good news of God in Christ. Many of us through this past week have been trying to find the right, right words to say in this post-presidential election reality. Some of us parents have been wondering how to talk with our children about the campaign and now the result. And especially how our standards of behavior at home and at school don't change because of politics and don't change because of an election. That more than ever we keep working 
to ensure that kindness and fairness and graciousness and equality and dignity for all is a living reality. For though the arc of the moral universe is long, it certainly bends toward justice. And when it comes to what must go on for the church and who we are called to be, Maybe even the answer to the question the shrewd steward asked, what am I going to do now? What are we going to do now? Some of the best words I read this week were from Reverend Julie Pennington Russell. She is the senior pastor at First Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. She writes, what remains constant following the election? The love of God, the calling of Christ, the empowerment of the Spirit. She goes on, come Wednesday, what will the community of Christ do regardless of whom we voted for on Tuesday? We will love and worship God. We will love and serve our neighbors. We will pray. We will act. We'll speak up for the voiceless. We'll stand with the powerless. We'll come alongside the hopeless. We'll plant seeds and paint pictures. We'll sing songs and hug our children. We'll do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our maker. We'll break bread with friends and strangers. We'll invite people to take a chance on God. And maybe we'll even take some fresh chances ourselves. We have the fresh chance of finding more and more ways to grow. My friend and colleague, Alan Shirouse, who's one of those dads trying to figure out how to talk to his kids, wrote something that I found kind of funny and moving this week, and I wanted to share it with you. I'm not checking my emails here. I'm actually going to read this to you. He says, I woke up in a haze of Alka-Seltzer, cold and flu. Or was it from something else? Greeted two rowdy boys in the dark. Over bananas and eggs, I told the oldest what we will always try to do with our strength. I interrupted Sophia the first to tell my daughter how strong and bold she is. She hears enough about being a pretty princess. Shared words of love and support with friends near and far. I love you. I see you. Listened to the voices of those not surprised and wondered why I am. What else have I insulated myself from? Had coffee with my wife Jenny and talked about what it all means. And oh yeah, we're supposed to go to the mountains for a couple days tonight. Is this a time for a retreat? Dropped a first grader off in the car ride line with the promise to practice baseball later came home to a pep talk and a bro hug from a neighbor, paused on the way in the door, and after a moment, I decided I would, in fact, turn on the sprinkler on this hazy Wednesday morning. We'll keep finding ways for things to grow. And none other than Tupac Shakur once wrote, even the rose grew in the concrete when no one else cared. Calvary, let's keep finding ways to grow. And to grow a lot of things. Not just growing the 2017 Calvary financial plan, although indeed we are doing just that, because we still need to use all the resources we have to make friends and to make ministry happen around here. To keep paying for lights and heat and air conditioning and technology and parking lot repairs. To keep fully funding our missionaries and mission partners and keeping our sacred space fit for Christ's call. To be passionate in our worship. To be unconditional in our hospitality. To grow our budget, though, for next year is a means to the end of growing ourselves spiritually and emotionally and socially to keep finding ways for things to grow and thrive and flourish.
If you haven't already received it, as Ann mentioned in the mail, you'll get a stewardship packet this week meant to help you think about what you can do to help fund Calvary's mission and ministry for 2017. There's a letter from Ann in there. There's a flyer that gives you a snapshot of the vital mission and ministries that transform lives, including our own. And there is a commitment card in there where you'll be able to write down what your giving plan is to Calvary for 2017. And deciding on a financial gift for next year that is something that can be realistic but also challenging and making some room to grow. We know that no one size of stewardship fits all, but a key question for all of us and each of us is, what is God asking of me in this season of my life and how will I respond What would connecting resources and relationships mean in your life this coming year? Truly, that is what we are doing as a church, being as shrewd as we can with all of our resources in order to be who we are called to be, to be who we're called to be so that we can do what we're called to do. We have to make money to make it in this world, but Jesus says that money isn't our maker. Money is only a means to an end, and the end is always to accomplish God's good work in the world. Dollars define what's most important to us, but dollars don't define us. The shrewd steward calls us to take a fresh chance at making spiritual sense of dollars and cents, making friends for ourselves with all the resources we have. Truth be told, we tend to get out of something what we put into something. And so I'd like to take this moment as we close to ask those of you who have been at Calvary for a long time and even those of you who have been here for a short time and you feel like you have been rewarded with this church family in your life, would you just stand up right now? Take a look around here. Our lives are richer and better and fuller when we invest our lives in what matters most. When we invest what is lasting once the thin pudding of this culture evaporates. What is the value of your experience of God in Christ through this community? Let us all think about this this week. As we begin to make our commitments and plan for ministry next year, let us remember the faces and the names of those sitting at our elbows in this room. And let us live our lives with a kind of shrewdness and intensity for God's sake that the world gives to matters of far less importance. Amen.